Welcome to the One Within All to another episode of Innerverse. If you're anything like me, you've spent a lot of time in your life either playing games or you've known a lot of people that play games. And you've probably already gleaned this from the title to this video, but today's topic of conversation are video games and how they have affected society at large. We're going to be speaking with George Mesa, who I first heard uh, speak about this subject on an episode of Crow 777, not too far in the past. I'll link that in the show notes here because you may find the additional context interesting. But when I heard that chat, I knew George was a guy that I wanted to have on the show myself because it seems like he has a similar perspective to me on how this phenomenon of video games has influenced the world and changed our personal lives dramatically. A little anecdote about myself. <laughs> I've come a long way since back then, but when I was a little kid, I remember at times being separated from my video game console out and about with mom and dad doing something that I didn't really care to do or bored and impatiently waiting. And I think to myself, thank God that I was born in this time period where we have video games to entertain us. What did those poor fools of the past do without all these amazing flashing shiny lights and buttons to keep their mind occupied? <laughs> like I said, I don't feel the same way now. I look at today's society in a lot of ways as a de-evolution from times gone by. But that being said, there are maybe not only negative things to say about games or gaming culture. So we're not going to be here to just rip on gamers or express the negative and why everything is so bad and horrible. But we are going to have a realistic chat about how social engineering has been achieved through these games and how it's worked its magic for good and bad on our generation. And it's a lot to get into, a huge can of worms. So I'm really excited to get into this chat with George today, but we're going to do something a little bit different new this episode. It might be something we continue on with. I like to take a moment and ground myself every now and then using vibrations and tuning forks. And I recently recorded some of my favorite tones and hooked them up to my mixer board so that on the fly, I can just hit you with tones. We're not going to take a super long time, but I think anybody can probably pause what they're doing for 30 or 40 seconds and receive these vibrations with us to help us get in the right mindset clear any stagnated, stagnated energy in our field, reset our perspective, and get ready to go on this wild ride through the digital virtual world. And so with that being said, here we go. I'm going to hit you guys with a little low and a high, and let's all just relax and receive that and let it do whatever it needs to do for our body and our field before we get into this phenomenal conversation. So here we go. Not a bad use of tech, if I do say so myself. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of that setup. I hadn't even been using this part of the mixer, but all right, it's time to get into this thing. George, how you doing, man? Welcome to the show. Been looking forward to talking to you for quite a long time. Why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's, that's the hardest part of the whole thing, right? Um, gee, where to, where to even begin? I am, I guess, what somebody could call a nerd pretty easily. And I definitely uh, fill all the requirements. I don't want to start off with this thing on the wrong foot. I, I've been a pretty strong gamer my whole life. And I remember the same thing you remember. Back in the day, I would <laughs> I'd always have times when it's like, when am I going to get home? I'm going to play this game. Or, you know, I would maybe choose a restaurant or a movie theater based on what kind of arcades they had in the lobby. I'm definitely not going to lie about that. You know? <laughs> but that's the, that's the old me. That's the old me. I'm, I'm almost, um, I'm like borderline bitter about it now. I, I'm, I'm thinking so much about my past. Um, and, and how much time I put into something like that. 
and I, I reflect on the, the positives and the negatives, and I hope that we can get to that. But, you know, as far as me, I'm a, I'm a musician by trade. It's what I've been doing for a very long time now. I've had students for over uh, almost 25 years, and I was uh, gigging exclusively for a little over 10 years. And that was, um, well, that was a crazy ride all in itself for sure. Definitely not as much technology on that ride, except for the amplifiers, I'd say. But um, other than that, I was actually going to be a computer programmer also um, at the turn of, you know, at the millennium there. I started in computer programming. I did a few years of that. And then right before I was about to get the associates and move on, because I was planning on continuing, I was planning on being a video game maker, actually, and uh, hopefully, you know, making the music also. I thought it would be a great idea just to do the whole kind of like a Wagnerian um, Gesamtkunstwerk, where you do like the whole thing, the total artwork, the, the you know, the words, the whole story, the, the, the games, the graphics, the, the music, everything. That was, that was my goal anyway. And I finished my associates. And then they said, you've been doing C++, you've been doing assembly, you'll keep that. And if we want to talk about those little bits and pieces, we can down the line. And they said, Java's taken over, you're going to have to start the whole thing over. They actually told me that I would, relatively speaking, have a useless degree and that I should redo it in Java. And um, I was already, I had a pretty strong, I was actually already gigging, I was already making money as a musician. And I was just hoping that this could be like the plan B. So I said, I think I'm a musician, I'm just going to kind of pursue that for a bit. So I ended up getting a music degree. And now I'm uh, the manager of Music Store, which I'm very proud of. It's a wonderful place. And I have lots of students and I get to kind of um, be with the community, which I tell a lot of people that come in that it's far more rewarding than the gigging life that I had, where um, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's not, I wouldn't say thankless, but you are merely entertainment. And that is a very important facet of something like a wedding, let's say. But when you're just at a restaurant in the background, it doesn't feel like much. You're, you're sort of, you're just kind of like wallpaper at that point, as we say in the industry, wallpaper, you know. <laughs> but during all of that time, I was always convinced that um, the games that I had played, the way that I played them, and I felt that I was very good at them, actually, you know, I, I took them seriously. I got something out of them. I got responsibility out of them, several other things that I think we can talk about later. But I always associated my, um, how I got good at music and how I practiced on my own. Never really had a teacher. I did go to college eventually, but that was more for the uh, theory and stuff. I wanted the inside, you know, the inside look. Um, I really think that it, it did indeed help me, you know, learn how to, how to develop, uh, how to gain, how to practice properly and not just be repetitive over and over again, how to, how to get better results. And um, how to and how to do something for ten hours straight and not get bored, knowing that there are results down the line, which is uh, something that I don't see in as many younger students nowadays. It's unfortunate, and I think that is because of games. And I hope that we can talk about that too. Actually, the games effect on work ethic and um, overall just uh, long term results as opposed to short term, which is what most, and particularly mobile games, but a lot of the newer games, it's quick, big rewards, very quick. And, um, you know, they don't, you don't get that in a, in a lesson room. You got to learn the instrument first. You got to learn to sk play scales, you know, before a song, hopefully. But um, that, that's a little tidbit about me. I'm also a brand new father and I'm super happy about that. And we got another one on the way. So life is just wonderful right now. It's crazy. I love it. Oh, yeah. I can see it in your face. How happy you <laughs> yeah. are about that. Thanks. That's wonderful, man. And what you said about your degree, that's just a little bit mind blowing and a symptom of the society we're in where. Back in the day, if you learned a skill or a trade, that thing was going to be around to stay. You sure. know, you became a blacksmithing apprentice. Well, someone's going to still need horseshoes in 50 years That's and right. you've got some job security. But programming's definitely not that way. The world of tech is just so rapid fire. Things are constantly shifting and evolving. And there's a lot to unpack what you said there at the end about gaming and reward pathways and work ethic. But I'll just say, you know what? I had a similar aspiration. I was a creative writing major in college with the goal, loose goal. I didn't really ever put much effort towards it because I was too busy playing the damn things. But I thought I wanted to become a person who did storyboards or did some sort of creative writing that would be used in video games because that's actually one of the upsides of gaming as a medium is the ability to tell a story. It's also a downside, just like in Hollywood, just like with movies. But right. to be able to have a personal connection to the world that's being built in the fiction can be a very powerful and very engaging thing. As a kid, that was generally what I liked 
in games. I, my other hobby was just nonstop reading novels. If I wasn't at a video game console, if I was like in the car or just out anywhere with my parents, at least I had a book with me. So I was doing to me, what was the same thing, which is also a negative in a sense of escaping to fantasy worlds. It's got its ups and downs, but yeah, I wanted to do the same thing. And I love the idea of being able to build your own game from scratch and do every single part of it. That's also one of the things about them. It's rather <clears throat> incredible and monumental in the modern time, how many people it does take to work together and bring their artistic skills like behind the scenes, all the different sketch artists that come up with character concepts or all the 3D modelers or the musical composers. And yeah, in the past, a game would have a huge emphasis. Well, it depends on what era you're talking about, right? Maybe we can go through the eras of gaming a little bit if you want to walk us through that. But in my childhood, which is not the Pong days, <laughs> but it's more like the PlayStation 1 era, there were games that just the story was the whole point. And there were the technology wasn't there for voice acting. And so if you were going to play through one of these 40, 50, 60 hour epic story games, you were reading the equivalent of a novel, no doubt, just by playing the game. And that's another thing that's kind of lost on modern games as well. And not just the, uh, the reading element, but like you said, so much of it is just quick and flashy and not really much substance other than a genre that informs the setting and the style and not really much to do with telling an interesting story unless you're trying to tell a story that is going to influence the the players into what they believe about the world and that's something i saw a lot of in 2019 actually it was in retrospect after the covid thing hit I started looking back and I don't play games like when they first come out, I usually wait till they're cheaper. So I'm not spending all my life savings on it, but I noticed how many games from 2018 to 2019 actually focused on a storyline or a plot element related to a pandemic or a virus. And I'm going to go through a couple of those as examples. There was a Spider-Man game in 2019, which was really just like a joke in terms of, <laughs> <laughs> being an actually good Spider-Man story as a Spider-Man connoisseur over here. I have the right to be a little judgmental okay. about that, but there was an entire plot in that game about a uh, bioweapon being released. The people in New York, the like non-player characters you'd encounter walking around were wearing masks. There was yeah. even missions where Spider-Man, the player had to like bust people for being out past curfew few yes I, it was I, just uh, wild and yeah there's more games than that that did that but it definitely seemed like when you we look at the big studios the big developers they have someone in there producing that is inserting ideas or concepts because they've been maybe told from someone higher up than them that this is an important thing to work into the game and i think largely the rank and file of the developers like the artists and the people making the music they're generally just kind of following orders and building the game as they're instructed and they get their own input to a degree. But like, I think that it doesn't take very many bad apples to in the uh, management to skew the way that a thing turns out towards the goal of social engineering. So I'm not sure <laughs> what's most interesting to you to talk about with that, whether it's the, uh, the history of gaming, how it's gone from, and we can get into all of this, but how it's gone from the Atari days to now to the cell phone, I'll loosely call them games that I see <laughs> kids playing on cell phones these days. They're really not <laughs> in any sense of having to like do something other than just mash buttons. But we could talk about that or we could talk about the social engineering a little bit. Um, maybe your perspective, I'd like to know your perspective on games with this pandemic theme that came out not too long before the supposed real pandemic. So you go for it. <laughs> I dropped oh, yeah. a lot on you right there. No, that's fine. That's fine. I didn't play the uh, Spider-Man game, but I watched my stepkids play through the whole thing, actually. So I saw all the things that you were talking about, the curfew, the, um, you know, the, the masks and everything. Absolutely. And then it's always one of those things where when it's happening, I saw them play when it came out. So it wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it that way. 
And then suddenly you look back because I went to go play it again recently. And I said, oh, that was in there. Right. And then there's another one, just another another scratch on the wall where, of course, this game was doing it, too. And of course, it's Marvel. No surprise there whatsoever. Oh, one um, other quick interjection yeah, is of course, of course. in New York, when you're swinging around a Spider-Man, there's graffiti on the walls in a lot of places. And I found numerous instances of a pyramid with an all seeing eye above it, just as graffiti uh, in the game world, like several and not just that symbol, but there was a lot of Masonic graffiti. Very strange. Yeah, yeah that occult stuff. You know, I, I grew up a little earlier. I was definitely functioning gamer in the 80s, you know, a little bit in the late like 87 and on. I was pretty well aware of what was going on. And I was, you know, getting all the, the games that I was hoping to get, at least in the Nintendo front for sure. And then some other stuff on the side, arcades and stuff. But um, yeah, the, the the idea that the the narrative can be controlled, I'm really glad you mentioned that because this is one of those things that you can't talk about with a lot of people. They they just say, oh, what is this? Is everything controlled? You're telling me that, that no one knew on the project, that most people don't have to know on the project. If you're working on, you know, hand motion graphics, you don't have to know what the story is at all, as a matter of fact. And uh, this comes back to one thing that I don't think people make the correlation with very often is that the writers are in the hot seat. And um, of course it matters who's, who's funding the thing. When it's Marvel, you, the, the money's there. You know, it's a triple A project. They've got millions of dollars going into it. And uh, the same thing happens when we get these pop stars. Marvel's Disney now, just so people know. Oh yes. You might as well just say Disney when you're talking about Marvel <laughs> at this point. <laughs> yeah, no, you're totally right. And I, um, I was hoping that, you know, that you had mentioned I was on Crow. I, one thing I didn't get to was the Square and Disney relationship. I'm sure we can, uh, throw that in at some point. That was definitely an interesting, interesting thing for sure. And um, but no, I, what I meant, what I meant to uh, correlate here is that when these pop stars come out, they often don't write their own music. Even if they say that they do, I don't think they often do. And there's a few writers behind them, people that you know, they're whoever they're whoever they are. Who cares? They're 60 year old people that have nothing to do with the culture or want the music at all. But they're the ones writing it, and they're the ones that place it in your lap for you to see a certain way. And I think that this happens very often now, especially ever since the PlayStation era, ever since they started adding these voice actors, these often high paid Hollywood voice actors, uh, too, to make sure the game could sell well. Um, you, you suddenly didn't have to read anymore. And it just it almost didn't hit home as much for me almost right away because I came from the other part of that. You know, I had even played Dungeons and Dragons sometimes where it's all narrative. It's all you making it up on the fly or at least telling the story. And same thing with the RPGs of the past. Um, you would you would read through hours and hours and hours of text. It was a novel. Every single game was a novel. And um, interestingly enough, you might not have read every word by the time it was done. And that that was one of the cooler things about it. Kind of wish that that was uh, as as common as it was. But um, the the masks and the curfew thing, uh, I I'm seeing it. It's so and kids cartoons a lot too. By the way, the masks they just random masks. I remember this one um, show. I won't even mention what the name is. Th this character was upset. At the, uh, thought their friend was upset at them. They wanted to hide their identity while they tried to make it up to them. And the costume was only one of these masks. And the show came out like, you know, just about three years ago, maybe right before the whole thing. It, it just ends up all over the place in your face. And it's very hard to notice it until right after the fact. Then you say, oh yeah, there it is again. It was right in my face right before. And that's part of the ritual. That's part of the magic. They're, they're clearly, you know, they, I say, um, they, they obviously want to put certain things in view. They want to use certain channels of doing it. And this, of course, comes to our conversation about the games here. It's always uh, there. Kids are playing games. And the more um, people that, you know, the people that fund these games, particularly companies like, um, I guess, Tencent is a really great company to mention and some other ones. They are, they're behind the scenes. They're pulling the strings. They're, they're providing the money. And they make sure that the kids are seeing certain things. They're, it's almost like it's social media in certain games, Fortnite and, and other games like that, you know, free to play games. It's almost like social media, which is another form of video game. I would definitely add uh, to this conversation too. Is that you know Facebook, Instagram, they're games. I mean, you you play them. You play them. Some people are better at it than others as far as getting friends, using it a certain way. And um, you know, I, I see people doing it for hours. Those mobile games don't seem to be as popular anymore. But the, you know, the social media, that's a game that's that's going really strong right now for sure. I went on, I went on a few tangents there. I didn't mean to go uh, so far from the original topic, but. Uh, the, the writers, they, they seem to be a big factor as far as who is the one behind the scenes doing it. The writers seem to have, if they're not slipped a little piece of paper as to what to add, they're, they're on board with what, whoever is wanting to this information to get out. And it's always timely. It's always right there. Yeah, I mean, the difficulty 
of analyzing that stuff and figuring out like where to point the finger or if there's a finger to be pointed is that reality is a little bit less <laughs> solid and I guess material than people would normally expect. And not everything that comes out of something that's pop culture, mass media, entertainment is necessarily even crafted in a certain way to pre-program. I mean, I'm not saying that that never happens, but there's also synchromistic coincidence, if you want to call it coincidence, where art imitates life and then life begins to imitate art and it's this strange cycle. So you can't necessarily look at just Spider-Man and say, well, they were trying to program us for COVID, although I think that's an extremely good example of all the examples. But there are, like I said, numerous. I mean, one of the worst ones that I saw was Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which was a game set. And we should just talk about Assassin's Creed as a series because there's a lot that it exemplifies that I would love to point out. But this game, you're set. The setting is like ancient Greece, like mythic times. And the player character very early in the game comes across a village that's like burned down. Everyone's dead. And you find a family there and they're all like terrified and scared. And they're like, save us from these soldiers. They're trying to kill us. And then the soldiers show up and they're like, hey, this village was infected with a deadly disease. And the only way to stop it from plaguing all of Greece was to murder everybody. So then the player gets to decide between murdering this family of literally a mother, father, and two children. Like this is an option in a video game to allow them to be killed in front of your eyes. And your other option is to kill the soldiers who want to attack them. So like anybody with a heart would probably be like, okay, I guess I'm killing these soldiers. And then what occurs later down in the line in the story, if you've made the decision to spare this family is, oh, Athens is beset by a deadly plague that's killing everybody. And as you walk around the city and you're exploring Greece, because you decided to spare this family, now everyone's like, sick and looking all leprous and right this was a 2019 game everybody (laughs) this is a huge triple a game and it might seem like a small plot point for a such a vast game that's literally like hundreds of hours to do everything which is another thing that we should talk about how these larger titles that do come in the sort of rpg genre of modern times have gone from being what used to be epic of 40 hours to unbelievable like 100 120 hours oh. and my dog is barking again so i'm going to mute myself and let you take it from there <laughs> <laughs> yeah i agree um you know maybe one or two games back in the day some some super nintendo and genesis rpgs were pretty long but um nothing like it is nowadays and this was the main game by the way in case anyone's wondering where i don't think you're talking about you know doing all the side quests that adds another you know 30 40 hours easily on a lot of these games and um, the main quest is often that long it's, you know, I, I remember some games were 70 hours, probably first time through, if you really wanted to, you know, get as much done as possible. And um, it's, it's, it's a long time to tell a story to begin with, you know, and if you don't play it right away, it almost, it's almost like a, a, a mild form of um, the OCD, and you have to do it as soon as possible. If, if you spend five, seven, ten weeks on this game, how much of an impact is the ending information going to have, as opposed to you beating it within two weeks really fast, all the information still really fresh in your mind. Um, it's an interesting risk to take as a game developer, I must say, is that this super long games, I always wondered how they made those decisions because, you know, I think it's it possible turned- now because there are, you know, the biggest demographic for gaming is people between my age and your age, not, right. I mean, children are playing games like crazy, but for these bigger titles, like we're describing right now, these Assassin's Creed type games, the target audience is people like us. And it just makes you wonder (laughs) how much like when i was a kid i i spent a full-time jobs worth amount of time playing games now it's like if i spent if i spent an hour in a day playing games i'm like oh i feel kind of like i really should have been doing some other shit but you know but still like what think about learning an instrument you teach people to play instruments what if all that time in childhood 
that was spent on games or even half of it, hell, not even all of it, half of it was put towards learning an instrument. Where would somebody be today? You know? So yeah. these are the other top other things to think about in this topic. Like it is not the only way that we can waste our time. So it's not like we're pointing out, Hey, gamers are the biggest time wasters on the planet. I'm, at least there's kind of some brain activity going rather than being fully hypnotized on a television show. But yeah, some of these games are like the equivalent of seven or eight seasons of a TV show all packed into one title. So different ways to zone out and kill time for different people. But it seems like modern society has given us plenty of options. Oh, especially now. Yeah. And then an interesting point to come up this too is now uh, whether or not a kid chooses. And I was the same way. I assure you, I played, you know, at least eight hour days very often. And, you know, just because, I mean, I, I just felt like it was, it was a, I felt like it was a hobby. I, I sensed that I wanted to go to college for it before all that. But um, I don't necessarily think I was playing with the goal of like, okay, I'm definitely going to do this for a living. So let me just do as much as I can now. It was more that, you know, I was an only child and it did offer me more time than I assumed that my friends, in all honesty, I, I'm sure I had more time because of that. And um, I did other things. I played hockey. I did read a lot also. And uh, my teacher didn't even believe me that I read a Stephen King book when I was younger. And I had a dictionary next to me. I did it. You know, I definitely read the book. Um, but, um, oh, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought for a moment. But the, the experience um, for kids now that they've had the, the op, they didn't have the option, they had to stay home. They were now given the opportunity to do whatever you want all day, stay home, you know, be on your phone, be on the, the system. It's great. You know, mom and dad are either working or they're really busy with other stuff. They're working at home, whether they're home or not, they might not have to be available. And now what I'm seeing, because I had to teach a lot of kids online and um, they were often dejected about the whole thing, really. They, they, not, not me or the lessons in general, but it was another screen. They're like, oh, hey, man, I just, I just had, you know, six hours of school on my phone and now I'm seeing you. And they barely ever practiced. And I got this sense of hope, and hopefully this can lead towards some of the optimism that we have to mention here, because I feel like games really did do a lot for me, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about those things. But they, now that they got the thing they thought they wanted, as in be home all day, do whatever you want. You don't, have to take out, don't even do any chores. Don't even take out the garbage. Don't even leave the house. And now I'm, I'm positive that they realize that that's not what they want. They want to go outside. They want the sun in their face. They want to be with their friends and interact in a way that isn't a LAN party or you know, some online game. I, I think that this might have actually changed some of their minds. I'm seeing it and I'm, I'm hoping that it is the result. So it'd be a positive aspect of this. Like a version therapy, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> doing so much of it that you can no longer stand it. I think that may be how I broke myself of being such a hardcore player of games. But I remember in college, my freshman year, I wound up becoming a raid leader in the game world of warcraft right. <laughs> and like a guild leader so on the positive i actually learned some like somewhat of leadership and people skills from doing that because even just like the real world in the world of warcraft there was there was all kinds of interpersonal drama especially because a lot of the people in this world are kind of antisocial to begin with so when you have a massively multiplayer online game with a bunch of antisocial people, yeah. there's definitely plenty of drama and people stirring the pot on purpose. And I did get pretty good at like one-on-one -on -one handling something with one person who has a problem with another person and not taking sides and, and all that, but at the expense of <laughs> doing any, I say at the expense of it, it's not like I had to, but I basically just didn't do schoolwork and I even skipped a lot of classes. I gained a ton of weight that year. It was all around pretty much a, a detriment to my life and my health, despite any positives. And now this isn't blaming the corporation that made this particular game, World of Warcraft, but I do happen to know that they being a huge corporation had actually plenty of psychologists on staff who their whole job was to figure out and help direct the developers into how the best way to design the game system would be to keep people really hooked and really addicted. So that comes with this. And this is what uh, one of the big aspects of social engineering I wanted to hit on with you, which it, with the gamification of society, which is that it used to be a Dungeons and Dragons idea that the more experienced your character, 
got, the stronger they got, and you'd level up and customize how they developed over time. And then that translated into plenty of early games that were true role-playing games in that sense, in that it was a fantasy world with a very imaginative story. And you had this character development that was a, a, a process in that. But now you can't really pick up a game uh, in any genre that doesn't have that type of a, a setup or a system. And I think that it's very different than a lot of what we played when we were younger, where think of Mario, Super Mario World. All right. The player starts the game on level one with the exact same capabilities of Mario that Mar Mario will have in the last level. Right. Right. So there's none of that. You're spending your time strictly just playing the game itself. The mechanics of the game are all that really matters and you're doing that. But now with the way everything has been uh, flavored like an RPG, but without actually the good aspects of being an RPG, you spend, and this is where I wanna get into free to play games and phone games, this is where I'm trying to tangent to. Now you see games where uh, the majority of what you're doing is just on gaining some sort of currency and then unlocking an endless tree of things to buy and unlock. And that's really the whole game. Like I've seen millions of phone games like this and people playing them where it, this is really specifically a phone game thing where there's not really much to the game itself. A lot of times there's this phenomenon called idle games where you literally don't do anything as a player to control what happens in the game world or a character you just are going through menus and unlocking things and logging in daily for rewards so that you can keep pushing those numbers higher. And that's the dopamine drip that they've developed these like evil <laughs> arch villain psychologists to, and it really works on uh, younger minds really powerfully, especially ones that don't even know the difference between these freemium games and what games used to be like where it was actually a game where there were actually mechanics you had to have actual skill and so i think all of that is very toxic and plays right into upcoming plans for a planet earth like what do you call it universal basic income i mean how is it different to receive universal basic income like weekly or daily and then spend that before it expires on approved items Right. versus a, a phone game where you get some of their fake video game currency every time you log in, and that's part of the reward. There's so much more to discuss, but we don't need to get into the nitty-gritty. Just people that have played phone games or attempted to play is a strong word. I've seen what these things are like. It's just a very depressing, like, attention-sucking like you need to check on it every five minutes, but you're not actually doing anything other than checking your phone. Right. It's a very weird phenomenon. And it's, I think, the worst direction that technology has gone yet in terms of bad for your brain, bad for your spirit. It's definitely bad for you in every way. I mean, it, it does take away. I like what you said about how they don't even realize that they're not genuinely speaking playing an actual game. It's really doesn't fit the requirements. I mean, if you if you do nothing but log in and just menu bounce, you know what is that? What is that doing? I guess it's kind of similar to a social media, um, you know, app. It's the same thing, really. You just kind of jump in and just just start making the screen move up and down the whole time, you know, just looking at what other people are doing or whatever. It doesn't seem like much of a game. And then, like you also mentioned, there's rewards for doing nothing. And this is another aspect that I'm noticing, especially as a teacher, but overall, as I see, I know I see a lot of gamers. A lot of my students are gamers. It's inevitable. And um, and I've got two, you know, older step kids. They're they're gamers too. And I see how different um the reward system is for them also, because it, it is that the rewards do seem to be the goal more than you even beating the game. I, I think people beat games a lot less. And that might seem kind these, of like... I don't think you can even beat these phone games. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there is an end or a way to beat it. It's just like an infinite loop. I think you're right, too. And that's another aspect. That's kind of an arcade leftover. Some arcade games didn't technically end. And that's the whole point, you know, get them, keep making them quarters happen. But um, it, it's really bad for the society as a whole. And, you know, it kind of goes along the lines where, oh, you're just a bunch of McDonald's eating 
you know, TV ingesting goons your whole lives and now you can't even, um, <laughs> you can't milk a cow. You don't know how to, how to grow a plant. You can't even boil your own water. You know, that kind of thing where, you know, <laughs> you don't need a microwave to, uh, to heat up food and you can eat without like the kind of modern luxuries we're used to. Um, it, it really is kind of changing minds or at least it's molding minds, which is, I, I hope that's something that you were thinking of discussing in general is just how the, the evolution of what games have become. And that's not to say the old style doesn't exist, but what you said was beautiful with the RPG elements. Cause even these, you know, 2d throwback side scrollers, uh, maybe like Shovel Knight and some other ones that I can think of, they absolutely have this RPG element where you can get bet, you can make your character stronger, or you can find some items that really help you just blast through the game, um, as opposed to Mario, where everything you need is available from the very first moment, and there's a few power ups sprinkled throughout the level, which include a pentacle and some mushrooms, and maybe maybe we can talk about the bricks and the pentacles and the mushrooms in a, a little bit later, but um, very and the uh, coins too, very interesting. Um, all the little choices that w that we've been getting over the years, and I, you know, starting with Pong, let's say, where anybody can play it without with no direction and no familiarity with the controller whatsoever, or any idea about the rules. If there's a number on the top telling you what the score is, you know, that's that's it. Any almost anyone can absolutely play Pong, and it's evolved so much now where you can't really just hand that PlayStation controller over and say, "Oh, R two is this. Make sure you press L three every time you see this happen." It's a lot, really. It's 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 a lot for somebody to do that doesn't do it very often. So there's this level of um, you have to kind of keep yourself as a polished gamer in order to even be able to play these games. You know, Assassin's Creed. It's at least um, eight, ten buttons, I'm sure. And because I I played uh, the second one, I think. And uh, very interesting. You know how how suddenly the modern gamer is a very talented gamer. There's a lot to it. You know, the common streamer is is I, I assume a pretty pretty damn good at these games. And uh, it takes a lot of work to, st to stay up on them like anything else. It's a respectable hobby. It's not just like a deadbeat thing, but it, it, it's kind of this concept I've been studying a bit, um, <laughs> a funny story that it came from this show called Xavier, a Renegade Angel. I don't know if you heard of that one. I'm sure some of your viewers have. And they mentioned just for a fledging little tiny moment in one episode, Baudrillard and Simulacra and Simulation. You know it? So- um, Oh yeah, that's like yeah. on my list to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice, dude. I, I, yeah. I, I got it. And <laughs> I think they gave up their stuff. I think that maybe maybe the character was inspired by this Baudrillard, the way he talks. I can see myself a little bit in the, the circular logic that he's got in some respects. But the idea that not only um, are people thinking that they're, you know, technically speaking, getting something done by becoming really good at games, unless you're going to do it as a career, of course. Um, it's still just a hobby. And it's replacing our ideas of reality, much like movies have and much like television always has. And it always does take some kind of monitor, some kind of television. Um, the, the, the distinction between reality and, and the digital world is really going away very quickly, where people are absolutely expecting the real world to behave like the digital world that they're presented with, because they see it far more than anything else, especially nowadays, especially with the lockdowns and everything that occurred. And it's really dangerous. It's really dangerous. People have expectations of reality now. And then reality is diminished for them before it ever happens, just because of things like games and definitely things like, you know, especially Hollywood and um, <laughs> news in general. <laughs> most news that's on television, I'd say, most mass media. But it all seems to go hand in hand. And uh, one thing I hope we can discuss is how the sequel, the world of sequels and movies and, and now video games too, um, and not just sequels, but remakes and retellings of the same thing, as in a Disney movie coming out as a live action movie all of a sudden. And they just keep wanting to make sure that same exact narrative, that same story is right in front of your face, because a lot of these stories are, there's tons of occult information in these stories and, and occult imagery as well, uh, very often. And I must say that I was introduced to all these occult Im uh, images when I was young from RPGs. They were mostly, you know, medieval times, kind of like dragons and sorcerers and stuff. And anything, you know, like Star Wars is swords and sorcery retold for sure. And it's the same thing. I, I got my connection to it through video games. I, I feel lucky that I, I was I witnessed all that stuff at a young age because it wasn't just a surprise to me when I was 18 that things like that existed, you know. Yeah, you can zoom in on any any number of games and basically determine that somebody involved with making it knew some deep occult knowledge, like 
And then they sometimes really pervert it and twist it. I think you may be familiar with the two-part series I did on the transhumanist tarot cards that were hidden in the game Cyberpunk 2077. Yeah, if anybody listening hasn't checked out those episodes and they're interested in this topic, though I, I broke them down both on my own show and also on a couple episodes of Unslaved. The, uh, with Michael Tesserion and the unslaved version is pretty off the hook because Michael really knows his tarot. But basically hidden in this game world, this Cyberpunk 2077, which is uh, enough, there's enough in that game alone in terms of social engineering programming and just straight up like apocalyptic warnings about the direction humanity is going to fill probably several episodes and that would be fun. But basically these tarot cards hidden in the world were the just most disgusting inversion of the original tarot imagery that anybody could ever imagine. But to develop this art, somebody had to know what the tarot actually meant in order to come up with the perfect inversion of it. In my opinion, I don't think that it just happens that way. Now, what you said about game, like um, people, younger generation starting to expect reality to work like the game well there's plenty being done and already developed to bring that about with the gig economy so first of all one of the things that pretty much all games now do that have a single player component is you have quests or you have your main mission and then you have these optional side missions that you can do and if you spend a lot of time on games you'll realize that what's being defined as like, who is a hero? What is a hero is a hero is a mercenary. And that's not the same thing, but they've been made into the same thing by gaming culture. In fact, probably half the RPGs out there have characters that are literally described as being a mercenary and merc, mercenary, merchant, mercury, all these <laughs> mercury is the God of, of thieves and doctors. <laughs> <laughs> and merchants. So there's, I mean, we've done lots of uh, etymology breakdowns in the past on commerce related ideas, but basically what I'm trying to get at is like these games are training the player and children to see life as basically you just find somebody that needs you to do something. You do whatever they say to the letter with exact instructions and like a GPS marker on where to go, no actual searching for anything or thinking about anything. And you just follow from point A to point B to point C, and then you get paid. And so what is a hero by this definition? It's somebody who will do whatever is asked of them for money, really good, bad, or somewhere in the middle. And at the very best, like in, in some games, you might have an element of choice, but it's usually like a choice between two very messed up options like there's oh, <laughs> i can't i can't think of how many times especially in that game cyberpunk where you're basically well the example was already given earlier on do you murder the family who's got a plague or do you murder the soldiers and let the plague spread that's the type of choices that they that people are being primed for but on top of that we have the gig economy that's risen up over the last decade and is only getting more and more powerful as a part of the overall work sector for especially younger people. And so this is really the same thing, like Grubhub, for example, you do it through an app. It comes up with an, a quest, if you will, which is deliver this to here for this much money. And you either take it or you don't, but then the AI behind the app is going to judge you based on it, how, what your acceptance rate is. If you've taken enough or if you've turned down too many, you'll get you know, either rewarded or punished with getting better or worse offers or more or fewer offers. And if something goes wrong in the process, the best you can do is like send in an email to somebody who maybe will possibly take care of it for you, but you'll just get an automated reply from their <laughs> system, most likely. And they've got this type of thing, this type of gig economy for all kinds of stuff now. I even heard of one recently called Handy, where you just go and like build people's furniture for them that bought some shelf that needs to be assembled. Right. And right. so first of all, 
like self-reliance is definitely on the decline. If you need people to deliver your terrible restaurant food, your fast food to you, because you can't even get up and go through the drive through or you can't, I mean, I get that there are some older folks out there that maybe could use a hand with putting together their furniture, but in the old days, that's what neighbors were for, or that's what your family was for. And that now it's an app and yeah, you can't really do anything you don't, like it takes away this entrepreneurial spirit from the younger generation where they're just being trained. Like I need the instructions. I need the handrails. I need to be guided. I need the GPS and I'm not going to be able to afford to spend the attention and the mental energy on like, well, how do I get clients for my job? Or, you know, it's taking out, it's literally like taking synchronicity out of people's life in terms of commerce or making a living. Because as you probably know, when you were gigging, the next gig, you might not know what it is till the previous one finishes up and you just happen to meet the right person at the right time in the course of doing following your passion, right? Opportunities arise in magical and mystical ways. But if you're just on the tracks of the, <laughs> the tracks of this AI driven gig system, are you really going to run into the same type of opportunities? Is there really any room for advancement? It's like being an employee for somebody, but worse because you don't even have a boss you can talk to about like, Hey, this happened. Can you exercise your judgment and be lenient about what happens next or, or what have you, you know, there's literally not even a human to discuss it with you. Your boss is the AI. So like the, the gig economy thing, I think is spun straight out of game culture and is a very negative manifestation of how things are going and how game psychology has led us there or primed us for it in another way of looking at it. It did prime us for it a hundred percent. And you're right about the, you know, it takes away the synchronicity of life that you're supposed to experience where you put something out there and it hopefully comes to you through hard work. Often it does, it can't just be a lucky break. Um, but yeah, you can have that food that is inaccessible to you right now, that Indian food that you have no ingredients for, you can have it in 20 minutes. Just give a call or just, I'm sorry, give a call. Listen to me. Um, just, press the button on your phone yeah, call we don't we have too much anxiety to call it. somebody we need to just like <laughs> use an app and like press buttons <laughs> type i want to type everything i don't want to say a word yeah exactly as a matter of fact i want to talk into my phone so the phone can do the typing for me i still don't want to talk to somebody but i'll talk to my phone no problem yeah there's plenty of that oh man and uh, i think a, a huge part to, to relate this to games directly 100 percent was experiencing the flow of how the arcade world kind of died in its own way. And I mean, it did die, but it actually, I watched the slow decline of it because I was a big part of my arcade scenes. I was always there. It was a whole culture. I wrote an ethnography on one in college because I figured that was the, that was the group I knew the best and studied the longest, you know, and it, it was like you had a neighbor, like you said, you get a neighbor and it wasn't as important. And I would never put it in that category, but if you were working on a game that you weren't sure about something, Maybe one of your arcade buddies already did it and they can help you with it. You had someone to talk to, you had a neighbor, you had a friend. And I developed many lifelong friendships through these arcade uh, people that I met. And one, one in particular is a super close friend of mine. Um, we have a lot more in common than just games. And you, you meet people through your community. You, you experience the synchronicity of showing up to an arcade. And then that person you saw two weeks ago is there again. And now you get to be even closer. You get to meet, you get to talk. Um, that whole idea of community died. And the point I'm getting to is that uh, online gaming it slowly but surely took over and you don't have to go to your friend's house to play this game anymore you don't have to bother your parents to drive you to your friend's house which was kind of fun i mean that was part of the fun you know you didn't know if you were going to make it to your friend's house you had to ask mom first and um i, I you know the, the people are missing out on that big time and online gaming i think you know I, it was on the dreamcast and there was even the sega channel on the genesis which was something you connected to the cable company they would be my used. god sega dreamcast yeah. and sega saturn they have yeah. it's, it's just really on the nose with oh I know. that company i know it's so obvious you know and uh come on now it, 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 it's it's <laughs> can't can't and genesis i mean <laughs> yes yeah, so that right, was right. my first console ironically the first game i ever played was a sega genesis begin at the beginning i guess begin at the gen, beginning. gen isis <laughs> yeah and that yeah. You know, this is a tangent. I want you to continue your thought. So I want to let, let me hold on to Gen Isis and yeah, talk well, about that. 
No, that's a good one. That's a good one, man. And um, so, you know, I watched the culture sort of change and quickly they were trying to say, okay, I think it was Fantasy Star Online on the Dreamcast was really saying, get a modem. You can play with your friends for eternally and you'll need them because the bosses are so huge, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I wasn't into it. I didn't have the resources for it regardless at the time. I wasn't trying to, you know, set up a whole good internet in my house at the time and make my parents have to spend more money, you know, than they probably already did. I could never repay my parents. It's impossible. Um, and then suddenly uh, the Xbox comes on and they have their own like subscription service. And now it's more of an, and now we, got, we have good internet for you. Just pay for the service. We've got a whole thing. You can buy games online. You don't even have to have a physical copy anymore, which is another thing I, I think we should definitely touch on at some point. Is the actual ownership of something and how it how it exists nowadays? A lot of digital gaming, uh, digital purchases. I'm sorry, and DLC. But um, you know they they made it so you had to have the online to play any games online. You had to pay for the subscription to the, whatever the Xbox Network, whatever it was. PlayStation didn't quite do that right away, and now they do have it also. But another thing that comes with that, and I I was so surprised the first time it happened to me. I don't remember which game it was. But I went to go play a one-player game that was developed as a one-player game, specifically, with no multiplayer. And you still had to sign up and be a part of it. It was Bethesda, I think. Um, you still had to be a part of it just to be able to play the one-player game. They had to have your information. You had to be logged in when you played. And Yeah, you had to have an online connection. This was touted as being a way to stop piracy of games, right. I believe. Which. Yes. Man, it's so difficult to actually pirate computer games in the first place or console games. Like, you should just let them have it. It's not that yeah, many right. people. If, if they went that far, yeah, I, I agree, you know. But it, it, I was against it because I was always all about community. I was always the guy that brought all my friends together every night, well, <laughs> every, let's say every weekend. And um, I, I did my best to always, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm that kind of person. I want everyone, I want to be the house that everyone comes and parties at. Just kind of how I describe myself as a bass player, actually, but also in the real world. Because, you know, my, my instrument and my playing reflects me as a person, for sure. And, um, and as a gamer, too, you know, I had a personality, I guess. And it, it was really a downer for me that people were so into playing online. Now, I understood it. I said to myself, oh, 3 a.m., I could, I could play online. I'm amazing. You know, that'd be so cool. But I just looked at it as a nice afterthought, as a nice addition. That was an option at a time when maybe no one was sleeping over. Maybe it was Wednesday night. And, you know, 2 a.m. is not an option for you and your friends, you know. That was but. me in high school when online gaming started to become a thing. Uh, the first one that I was able to really play was Halo 2. And, man, the Halo series, that's got so much symbolism in it. It's oh, basically yeah. a transhuman romance between a cyborg and an AI. But, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I would... Basically stay up till two or three in the morning now that I had the ability to play multiplayer style games anytime because of Xbox Live, that, that service, uh, and Xbox, <laughs> even that name is really, <laughs> you could break down and decode that too. But yeah, I, I would wind up, I mean, not that I was missing out on much at high school other than a different type of programming, but I would pretty much sleep through half of my classes in high school because I was staying up so late playing Halo 2. So. Definitely. Definitely. Oh, yeah. And yeah, the before that though, we would get together and have land parties where my friends would all come over to one house. And that was like an adventure because you had to get, you had to figure out how to get enough TVs and enough consoles and enough controllers and get all the people there. And then we're all physically there. And, you know, if something goes wrong in the game, your friend might actually come downstairs and like try to physically fight you. And that was fun. <laughs> And those are good times. Social yeah. skills were still a part of it. Definitely. And people could still, and I'm not saying this is across the board because it is not, but people were, had a higher proficiency of reading and writing. And I think it's going downhill. It, it seems to be anyway, especially when you can well, now Google will tell you how to answer email for you. Oh yeah. Or how to, how to write in an envelope or anything of that nature. You know, it, you don't need to know anything. And I've heard people say that maybe 15 years younger than me. It's like, I don't even need to have that information in my brain whatsoever. I can just use my phone. And I, and I think to myself, if your phone was dead, would that mean that you still didn't need to know that information? You know, if, if your phone's dead, dead, does it mean your brain dead? <laughs> yeah, <it's at> the <laughs> end, yeah. <laughs> disconnected, done. You're, you're out of the matrix. And um, geez, you know, but that's, I guess that's more of the simulacra too. It's where you're assuming that your technology and, and how it's just another extension of you uh, will always be there for you like a good friend as if as if it could be a good friend but it, it does nothing but um make your life a little too easy much in the same way that windows is much easier you know easier to use than 
uh, Linux or something where you have to know path names as opposed to just clicking a little button. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really change much. I mean, you could, you could write them all down and have a little database for yourself. It's not that big of a deal. It doesn't make anything that much better. And um, I, saw, I, I noticed some very odd synchronicities with Windows, by the way, having to, uh, managing the store and knowing what kind of operating system we need and stuff. We all had to go to Windows 10. Everyone had to do it. And it was January of uh, 2020. It was just right around that time. It seemed such an odd coincidence that everything had to run on Windows all of a sudden. Just more, you know, computer stuff that is related to what's been going on. Yeah, I make money doing IT. So I was in that world back then and uh, having to update a bunch of computers at the place where I worked to be Windows 10 compliant and every different software required it. And after that, there was uh, an ongoing issue that I had where even though I turned off the computers updating automatically, some automatic updates would still get through and like major settings would just one day be reverted. Like say you had a different way to open PDF files on a computer with a different program other than whatever the baked in Microsoft one was. One day you would just come to the computer and all those default programs were set back to the Microsoft one, not the one that you had told it to use. And just like, when, when did I give permission for Microsoft to come in and change my computer settings for me? Like this is, and it's just going further in that direction. I mean, you, basically nailed it when you said own nothing or you don't own things anymore. Like you do you really own something if you have to have an online internet connection for it to work. If it's only not, like, you know, I used to be proud of my boxes, my collection of game boxes and they had cool little booklets with art and instructions on how the game worked and like snippets about the world and the story. And when I was in elementary school, I would, take those like game manuals with me to, yeah. to school and be like, Hey guys, look at this one I got. And we'd look at the artwork and like, we, you know, there's some imagination there, but now yeah, everything's just holding your hand and it's all uh, there's, <laughs> there's no learning curve to anything that you play hardly. I mean, there's some more retro style game designs, but what I want to get into in hour two is more of sort of the spiritual questions of, gaming and simulated worlds and virtual unreality, if you will, to sure. get into that Baudrillard question, simulacra, <laughs> simulation and simulacra. Uh, I've done some content on that stuff before, but not really on my own show. So people that follow me closely will have probably heard me talk about these subjects over on Unslaved Podcast or on uh, Lindsay Sharman's Rogue Ways. And I think I've talked about it on Beth Martin's channel as well. And those are all really good conversations. So I'm not here to rehash that stuff, but I do want to talk about in hour two, Gnosticism and simulation theory and how gaming ties into these seemingly different ideas, but that in my opinion are tied together at the root and that root is rotten. (laughs) Not that I'm trying to rip on people who consider themselves Gnostic, but we're gonna examine these ideas of is our world really even real and why should we think that it is or isn't what's (laughs) why do people think one way or the other and how games have informed those questions and to go back to the uh, genesis sega genesis gen isis i think that what we're seeing here with not just not just the hardcore gamer culture but really all of these entertainment based ways of existing and basically what i would call it is in a desire to return to the womb is what is at the root of a lot of this behavior for humanity and it's not really that different than wanting to return to the undifferentiated potential of oblivion if you will of kind of non-existence of dreaming endlessly and this is a why I brought up Gen Isis because that womb that we're being that's being built for us to enter in a Ready Player One style way is basically uh, the the goddess that all, a lot of these secret societies or cult traditions would all venerate. It's all one being. You could call it Sophia from the Gnostic perspective. You could call it Isis. It could be Columbia. 
it's all, I think the same iconography that's just being rolled out in different places with different names for different cultures. But at the end of the day, it's the sea, it's the, it's Maria. <laughs> it's the, it's the original womb that's being simulated here by all of these digital synthetic creations. And so we'll get into a lot of that in hour two, but I think we still have a good couple of five plus minutes to, uh, to rock out here in the first hour. And so what do you want to get into for the free listeners to, uh, to finish off any thoughts you might've had? Well, I think one thing that we should probably, since we have a shorter amount of time, maybe we didn't get to talk about the positives as much. And I certainly don't get to talk about anything positive anymore. It seems all I ever tell people is you need to practice more. And <laughs> it's, 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 it's not as much fun as it could be. Right. But I, I want more, positivity from everyone I know. It's, it, I wish that it was, but it just doesn't seem that way. And I think it has a lot to do with maybe news as much as it could have to do with entertainment in general, which just has a bleak and dismal look on things, except at the very end when everything's perfectly fine at the last 30 seconds. But I know, period. man, when I try to like someone dumps on me, all their stuff, you know, and I just say something positive back, they're like, you're invalidating me. Right. Not, right. not always, but this happens. Like it definitely happens with all, a lot of people that I know. It's like, I wasn't trying to invalidate anybody. I was just dating something that was a more positive intention. And yeah, we're definitely programmed to just do nothing but send and receive bad news, bad vibes. Yes. And I, I was aspiring to say to myself, okay, I can think like this computer now and therefore I'm able to manipulate it. This is gonna give me a benefit. It's gonna make me a value add. It's gonna make me an asset to some company or to my own coding world or whatever I planned on doing back in the day. And I'm starting to realize very quickly that that I think that it's, you know, I don't wanna, I'm not trying to say it in like an immature way, but that seems to be what they want for us. It really does. They want us to be more like a computer because what is easier to manipulate than a computer? Um, the damn thing does exactly what you tell it to every single time and uh, without fail and it doesn't know much it reads one little tiny number every single moment of a binary idea it, it's a very very primitive design still this whole binary concept and for us to be um given the option or the opportunity i should say especially in our generations to very easily become that kind of thing that kind of being um it's so easy to, to put us in the place of a sheep and you obviously can train us which I believe that I, at to some point there was a lot of training and it's, it's a detriment, you know, and then there's something negative, but um, on the positive end, if you realize it much like I hear constantly throughout the, the wonderful community that, you know, podcasts like yours have is that now you can see it. And as a result, whether it exists or not, you at, le at the very least can avoid it affecting you. And you may even be able to help somebody else realize it because a lot of people um, I don't think that they're against you telling them, hey, you know, put your phone down for a second, maybe for 10 minutes, maybe for seven minutes, you know, just give yourself a little bit of a break before you go to sleep here. Um, it's not taken too well. It's, it's kind of, there's a lot of backlash now. It's like, what? I, leave me alone. I'm on my phone. And, um, I, you know, I, <laughs> I hope that it can change. I hope that uh, people like us can help them see it because I was that person, not on a phone front. I always did, treated the phone as a phone and nothing more for the most part. But with games. Oh, yeah. I had a Game Boy as a kid. I'd take it yeah, everywhere. But at least the, when I was doing that, I was like kind of progressing in, a, in doing right. something instead of like completely mindless, hypnotized scrolling. You're totally right. And again, that comes back to the reward aspect or um, just learning how to manipulate something. The mechanics of the Mario games, the jumping system is actually very energetic and, and, and fluid. And it's nice. It's fun. The height and, and um, different varieties and speed that you can learn to manipulate and that is one of the positives. I think those kinds of developmental things, I catch on to things quick because of it in my life, I think. My reaction I, time is super quick. I may be clumsy, but I can catch something before it hits the ground after I drop <laughs> it because probably because of gamer reflexes. There's some hand-eye coordination dexterity benefit there for sure. Yeah, definitely. And also just walking into a room and noticing, you know, catch 10 things right away. Um, that can help you in a bind, you never know. It's a good skill to have to be able to scan something and to get a very good idea of all the things that you've seen. Um, th this is a, a great aspect of, especially like the 3D open world games and stuff like that. And also just having an attention to detail overall. And I think another really good aspect of it is being able to spot things like video fakery, in all honesty. I think a life of, well, I Godzilla movies and uh, video games, I, I really 
do think that I am very, very good at catching like green screens and other things that are often hiding in, in certain things that are very easy to catch if you know what you're looking for. But it goes way over most people's heads. And it might be because they didn't grow up in the game culture or they just never played a lot of games or didn't want to lot, watch a lot of movies or it's, it's in every Hollywood movie, but they don't realize you're not thinking about it. You know, and um, I think that it's a, it's a very good trait, I must say. Yeah, <laughs> there's so much that is faked on the cable news networks, like all the time, if you just flip on uh, during like a big storm or something that they're trying to make a lot of hay about how deadly it is. There'll be a weather channel representative or a CNN, like in the field anchor somebody and they'll be like, whoa, and but their hands are up and they're like trying to block the wind and in the background you might catch like somebody walking by like nothing's happening normally oh, yeah. or yeah a lot one thing that you can also catch probably from playing games maybe and being used to it is uh, how lighting will look when somebody's in front of a green screen but they're pretending that they're really there and man like what in what in the modern world of of institutional indoctrination isn't pretty much a green screen, a simulation of fake from NASA to presidential press conferences. It's very bizarre. And if you do have experience with these like computer generated images, it can give you more observational power to catch what's going on there. Yeah. There's, there's probably plenty more positives that we've derived out of it, but you know what? At the end of the day, you know why those positives exist from a lifetime of, we're not a lifetime, but from many years of kind of being a slave to a thing is that we made them into positives. We turned them into something. You did that yourself. You made a decision that the, that you weren't going to make, let all that be for nothing or go to waste that even when you're doing something that's just downtime or entertainment is, you know, you probably are like me. If you do watch a TV show or a movie, you're not just passively uh, absorbing it or half paying attention while looking at your phone. You're probably like me, it sounds like, and you're paying attention to every word uttered and everything in the background that your eyes can catch and all the little symbols and all the messages that are hidden in there. And that symbolic literacy that we're talking about is the first and probably most important line of psychic self-defense. I say it all the time, but symbolic literacy is psychic self-defense. And you can hone that and train that on any number of platforms or ways. And games are definitely one of those ways. And if people think that Hollywood was bad with how infused and laden with symbolism and social engineering and programming, it, that, that it is the gaming world has surpassed that it, by leaps and bounds. And is a much, much larger industry at this point than Hollywood. So I hope that people out there, even if they don't have a history of, of being a gamer, I don't think anybody in the world has probably lived a whole life in the Western nations without some exposure to the things we're talking about, either through them experiencing it or seeing somebody they know. And it's a sad thing when you know a grown man can't even hold down a job because like you know, if they were as good at making money in real life as they were at making money in World of Warcraft, how much money would they have? And it's also, <laughs> this is a totally different can of worms, but I just want to throw it out there for people to think about and chew on, is uh, how have games in the world of video games informed the rise and development of cryptocurrency culture? How many of these hardcore crypto veterans that are now spearheading the adoption by everyone else the, how many of them came from a background of video game money, <laughs> video games? And is that why it's so easily acceptable that ones and zeros in, a, in an ether are an acceptable form of value storage when by no definition do these things actually fit the description of money in a traditional, <laughs> at least by a traditional dictionary and I've done content on that in the past too, so we won't linger on that point. But George, we got to move over to hour two. And I'm sorry, we can't take you all with us. Actually, we can, but you have to choose to come with us by joining on Patreon or Rockfin. So check the show notes in the description for that or hang around for my outro if you're going to stick with the freemium version. 
but the we're going to go deep on hour two, more esoteric, more more of the spiritual side of things. Not that I'm trying to keep you guys out of the conversation, free people, but you know we got to cut it off somewhere. So, George, thanks for being here, and looking forward to going further. Thank you very much. Can't wait for the rest. Oh, you know what though? Before we do that, is there any way that you'd want to be? if anyone wanted to contact you for some reason, or if there's anything out there that you want to promote of your own, or are you just here to talk about games and hang out? <laughs> oh, well, I'm definitely here to talk about games, but yes. Um, you know, I feel like it's an important message. You know, a lot of people grow up and don't realize that something's happening to them. So I hope we can open a few eyes, you know, but um, my, I'll give you my contact information. I don't have anything to promote at the moment. Um, you can email me anytime. I'd love to chat. You have a, a great audience and I'm sure any one of them would be a friend of mine as well. Um, the email is erp minded e r p m i n d e d at yahoo.com. All right, thank you. I'm glad I caught that. All right, well, yeah, we'll see everyone over on hour two. Thanks, man. All right, friends, that is the end of another super special, awesome episode. Kind of an overdue conversation because video games for me were a huge part of my life, and I probably bring it up often in tangential conversations but having a deep discussion about what these uh games have done to society what society is like or turning into now that people who grew up on these consoles and computer games are in charge of how things are working it's a pretty big issue me personally i have a huge gripe with this whole gig economy Uh, Mostly because I've watched a lot of people do stuff like Grubhub and just be constantly screwed over by the system. And there's no one to talk to. I mean, I don't like having a boss, but I'd rather my boss was someone I could actually have a conversation with (laughs) and plead to rather than an AI algorithm. It's kind of gross, but we got into that pretty well in the conversation. Don't remember if that was first hour or second hour. But I do have to say thank you to George, and I hope that he pronounces it George and it's not Jorge. <laughs> Someone told me when it's spelled like that, it's Jorge, but I figure, figure he would correct me if he really cared. <laughs> anyway, that's my little insecurity with names. It's easy to mispronounce people's names as a podcast host, apparently, because I do it all the time. But other things I feel like I'm doing well, I'm doing right. Things are going Awesome. In the uh, SSS Interverse, SSS, SS Interverse, why is it a ship now? (laughs) I don't know. I'm just talking to you guys. But I really am excited about what the future holds. I've got so much fun stuff coming up. A really big week. It feels like after all of the eclipse energy and the Mercury retrograde that we just went through, that I finally have my head up out of the water. I don't know if you guys can relate to that, but it seemed like all of a sudden, a few days into July, and things just started firing more easily, mentally, uh, energetically. I don't know, but huge opportunities came my way this week. Really excited to share the uh, outcome of that with you guys when it does occur. Don't want to give it away before it's complete. If you caught my interview with Beth Martins, where I was on her King Heroes Journey podcast again. We talked about the virtues and vices of stealth. And I know that I already posted that to my RSS feed. So if you're checking out this episode, you probably already saw it in there. But if you did watch it that way and you didn't go subscribe to Beth, please do. She is a wonderful treasure and her YouTube channel should not only be on your subscription list, but you should hit the bell and make sure that you're notified when she's going live because she's usually live with her stuff and that makes it fun because you can interact with her. And you know, while you're at it, why not hit the bell to uh, get notified on YouTube when Interverse puts a new episode out, eh? Or if you're in the advanced crowd, you could go and watch on Odyssey or BitChute or the uh, super advanced crowd <laughs> and check it out on Patreon or Rockfin where you get, of course, the second hour of all the conversations and uh, the rock fin doesn't have the full archive of the podcast up yet. I'm chipping away at that and putting up things as I can, but on Patreon, you get all the things I've ever done for extended plus member content. rock has got everything from 2021 and a lot of really juicy ones from last year too. Upside of rock fin is you get access to everybody else who's got a, a channel on that network doing premium stuff. 
but it is $10 instead of five, which is what the Patreon costs. But either way, you have two choices, two ways to get the extended show. In this episode with George, we got deep in hour two. I feel like hour one was the more exoteric conversation and hour two was the more esoteric conversation. I kind of plan it that way. It's like the uh, kiddie pool in the deep end. <laughs> Not that I'm calling you a kitty. If you only listen to it, the uh, free hour, I'm still grateful that you're tuning in and hopefully getting some useful insight and knowledge and uh, positive vibes. Specifically, I want you to get positive vibes because we can go anywhere, talk to anybody for the type of stuff that we get into on this show. Well, not anybody, but you know, nobody needs anything about a certain podcast in their life. But what hopefully we bring to the table here on Interverse is some much needed positivity and lightheartedness in the face of all the crazy social engineering going on. And that's always been going on, apparently. That was a big topic in hour one, of course, how gaming has changed culture, gamification of society. But in that second hour for the extension, we got deep on the question of simulation theory. Are human incarnations sort of like a spiritual version of a video game that we are playing as avatars in this material realm that we can co-create in and share like a massively multiplayer online game? And the soul behind the incarnation that goes through different incarnations could be like the player in the game. I don't know. That was a part of the conversation we talked about. But I also wanted to discuss simulation theory on that vein and why I think that simulation theory is just a materialist version of inverted Gnosticism, which is what I refer to at any belief system, including most of the standard dogmas of the desert sky god judeo-christian religions any religion that postulates that the world is some fallen or evil place created by a lesser god or ruled by a devil and if there's any hint or inkling if i catch a whiff of anybody's cosmology having something to do with the body being a prison to escape from i'm out <laughs> i'm out at that point because this is the alchemical master not me, but the body, my body, your body, that thing is the temple and the home of the divine. And that's a big responsibility. And it, I mean, for me, that can get scary. Sometimes whenever I remember who and what I really am, which is the same thing as what you are, I am what I am. It freaks me out a little bit. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's too much. I can't, <laughs> I can't be all that. I'm just me. I just want to curl up and spend some time vegging out and go into a hypnotic trance and maybe play some video games or something. But, you know, these, these things come in waves and sometimes it feels better to remember who we are. And other times that powerful energy of remembering can start to really shake loose all the things that we're doing to betray that body temple, to betray that house for the spirit, which is the thing that actually diminishes and weakens our connection to spirit. So hopefully an hour or two, you get a lot of fun insights along that vein. I do hope you subscribe. I could use the support. The more of you guys that support me with your five or 10 bucks a month, the more of this I can do. And one of the things I'm doing more of is going on other people's shows. Like I said, I was on Beth Martin's King Hero Journey podcast. And if there are any hosts out there or panel shows you want to get me on, please contact the people that run that show and say, hey, I have a guest suggestion. Check this guy out. Oh, yeah. Speaking of being a guest on other shows, I may have mentioned it last outro, but I was on Unslaved again talking about vibrational healing, biofield tuning, you know, the tuning fork stuff that I'm super into. And I may be a novice at it, but I keep getting very profound results by working with the forks. And of course, I'm learning as I go and I think getting better at it. But to a degree, it's just like putting that tone and that coherence in your field does move things and get stuff going. So I really encourage everyone to explore those modalities, uh, sound healing, sound therapy for yourself, get a sonic slider. And uh, that's the thing that Eileen Day McCusick invented. It's a on the body tuning fork that's super rad. 
But now I feel like I could probably wind my way towards the uh, end of this ending <laughs> because I really want to get this show put together and out to you guys. There's so much more in the works. I got to keep cranking through it. And I was a little slow in June, but like I said, it was all that eclipse retrograde stuff. I just took my time try not to be too hard on myself for doing so. And uh, I don't know. I try not to also worry about if we're like gaining or losing a lot of members, but I don't think that I took a huge nosedive because I wasn't producing. Anyone that joined recently would be able to go through a giant archive of stuff that they haven't heard before. And uh, that's one of the reasons why it's such a good idea to get on plus, even if you only want to pay for a month of it at a time and then come back a few months later and catch up all at once. That's all good. I'm not trying to extort money out of you. I just want to get a system of reciprocity between us. So yeah, check out the uh, plus archives, everybody. That's the third and fourth and fifth time. I'll beg you to do that. <laughs> I'm going to play us out with a song called enter the void. I think that's what it's called. I could be getting that wrong. Oh, well, it's by Wolf Tech and the uh, link will be in the show notes, of course. And, you know, in the outro video, it will have the correct title. If I just botched that, I don't feel like clicking around and looking for the file, but it's a really rad track. I love playing music at the end of the shows. And if you are out there in the audience and you make music, why don't you join our telegram group and share it with us over there or maybe you make art of some other kind or you're producing content of any flavor that's uplifting or positive or intended to be. So our telegram group is really rad and they've got so many geniuses in there that I can't even keep up. <laughs> so uh, if you want to get in on that action and get yourself out of the nasty mainstream fed book, Instagram, nasty gram, social media sites, telegram's the way to go. It's like a human search engine. You don't ask Google questions. You ask real life people that actually are aligned to at least a large degree with what your intention was behind the question in the first place. So do that. Join Telegram. We'd love to talk to you there. It's my favorite way to connect with everybody and the easiest way for me to do it. Sometimes I even do daily tarot card reads like I did for a while and haven't for a while yet. <laughs> Uh, man, the one today was just too hard. Uh, it was it was too personal, hit too close to home. I didn't really feel like sharing it with the group, but I'll keep sharing them pretty frequently. Don't worry if you like that. So yeah, that's it for this episode. Thanks again to George. And if you like George, don't forget also that there's an episode with Crow777 that he was on talking about gaming. We didn't really rehash any of the stuff that he talked about there, at least not too heavily. I think it was a great continuation of that conversation because I listened to it and I liked it a lot. That's how I found out about George. So that'll be linked in the show notes too. Everything's linked in the show notes from the music you're about to hear to even a link to buy a t-shirt that has the Interverse logo on it. If you want. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're out of here. You have a good one. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>